but human beings are, in a sense, you know, continuous. There's, there's no sharp distinction between one kind of uh, ethnicity and, and another. That we, and we exist on a continuum. Where you draw the line to distinguish one kind of people from another kind of people is, to a certain extent, arbitrary. What creates these uh, identities is, to some extent, circumstance. You could be isolated and perhaps even in conflict with another group, which will solidify that sense of identity. Sometimes that identity is solidified by the emergence of, uh, of nation states. So that's what creates people who are French or Italians or Germans or Greeks, mm. but historically these people weren't actually French as such before France became um, France. It was made up of many different peoples before Germany became mm. Germany. It was also full of different peoples in Italy before unification. People spoke many different languages. In Indonesia, similarly, people spoke and still speak many different languages, but uh, now you might identify an Indonesian ethnicity, but it's not something that's real in a different mm. sense. It's become a reality because of, uh, of politics. Mm. Welcome to the AIER Standard. I'm Ethan Yang. Chandran Kukathas is a professor at Singapore Management University and one of the world's leading political theorists, who previously led the political theory department at the London School of Economics. Today, we caught up with him at the Mercatus Markets and Society Conference here in Falls Church, Virginia, just a little bit outside of Washington, D.C. Our discussion touched on his ideas about national identity, as well as his praises and critiques for one of his intellectual heroes, Friedrich Hayek. I hope you enjoy our discussion. Chandran, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Of course. And um, so it's un my understanding you flew in all the way from Singapore, that's correct? That's right. Yes, I'm uh, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at Singapore Management University. Mm. And um, so what brought you all the way here to D.C. for the Market Society Conference? Well, I've had a long uh, association with uh, the Institute for Humane Studies and the Mercatus Center. I'm a, uh, a regular visiting scholar here. I haven't been for a little bit because of the pandemic, but uh, I'm also spending a week here at Mercatus, and I uh, basically organized that to coincide with the conference, to which I've been invited by the uh, uh, Mercatus people. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, I hope that long trip is worth it. Um, it's also my understanding you've taught basically around the world. Can you give us a little bit of uh, understanding of sort of where you've been and what you've been teaching? <clears throat> Well, I completed my undergraduate degree in Canberra at the Australian National University. I was uh, brought up in, in Canberra where I went to high school. I graduated from there and then got my first teaching job at the Royal Military College in Canberra as well. Then I went to Oxford to do a doctorate where I also taught for a year, had a brief time at George Mason University as a postdoc. Uh, which is when I first met a lot of the people who are now at Mercatus mm -hmm. at the Institute for Humane Studies. Then, as chance would have it, I returned to Canberra to a job at the ANU and then at the um, Australian Defence Force Academy, which is a, a part of the University of New South Wales. And that's where I spent most of my career until I moved to the University of Utah for four years mm. uh, to take a chair in political science. And then I moved to the London School of Economics, where mm -hmm. I was for another 12 years. And then Singapore uh, approached me to take up a position as dean in, in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the School of Social Sciences. And I knew Singapore quite well because I'd been there for about six or seven years to teach over the summers. And I also grew up in Malaysia before I moved to Australia. So. I was quite familiar with the region. Mm. So that's pretty much the extent of my uh, teaching and university experience. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that you, you know, you fashion yourself some sort of liberal, you believe in markets, uh, open societies. Do you think that just moving around the whole world, teaching in different places has given you a different perspective than perhaps some of us who've never left the United States might have? 
I'm, I'm sure it's shaped my thinking in some ways, um, though I think there are lots of people within places like the US or Australia or, for that matter, in Malaysia who are pretty international in their thinking without having necessarily moved around as much as I have, or maybe, you know, maybe not at all. But uh, I, I'm sure that having been in different countries for so much of my life has shaped the way I, uh, I think. It's probably made me a lot less uh, of a nationalist mm. than I might have been otherwise. Mm. And um, guys, can you, can you maybe explain that uh, you're thinking about nationalism and how it's um, evolved? I'm, I'm assuming you might have some presentations this weekend about nationalism. And I guess especially now when uh, nationalism sort of back in vogue across the world. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, what I've written about it really has come out of the work I've done on immigration most recently, and then before that, to some extent, my work on, on multiculturalism. But uh, personally, I think it's probably the case that my thinking has been shaped by my international um, life and consequently my uh, much less um, commitment to uh, attachment to a particular country. I mean, I grew up in Malaysia for part of my life, so uh, that's a, an important part of the world to me. Um, I've lived for 30 years of my life in Australia, so I still cheer the Australian cricket team. Mm -hmm. I have that mm. kind of attachment. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I've lived in the UK for about 16 years. So I have you know, a lot of affection for the place. But I think affection for a place is one thing, but seeing it as an important part of your identity is something else again. And I think I don't identify with any nation, even mm. though I have an affection for a lot of different places mm. uh, in, in different ways. Hmm. And I guess uh, perhaps a, there's a been a lot of commentary on national identity and, and common political discourse. So I was wondering, do you think um, do you think it's able you're able to or society in general is able to run a coherent like political state without uh, some form of nationalism? Do you like I guess my question is is if everybody sort of thought in the way you do, do you think we have politics as they exist today would be would be sustainable? I think it would be. Um... <clears throat> In part, I think this because even if you think about the United States, the extent of uh, national sentiment or national feeling, the extent to which Americanness is invoked by different parties, is a relatively new phenomenon. It's mm. not something you saw so much in, say, the 19th century or the early 20th century. Mm. So for my way of thinking, Invoking national interests or national concerns is really something that happens when some people within the, the political elite want to make something of an issue or they want to gain something. So usually the easiest way to, to do this is by telling people that they're under threat or they've been mistreated in some way or that others mm. uh, are different or alien in some way. And it's not surprising that at some point someone would invoke uh, nationality or some form of, of identity. So uh, I don't think it's necessary. I, I don't think a society needs that in order to run. In some ways, it will make a society run worse mm. because it will distract people from uh, issues that are more significant, that are more practical, that, that actually need attention. Mm. Drawing attention to uh, questions of nationality doesn't actually solve anything. Mm. All it does is uh, divide people. Mm. I can't see why this would be an advantage in running any society. Mm. And then so what would your response be to those who say, um, you know, most states are sort of like these nation states, perhaps an ethnic state. For much, many countries are ethnic states. So um, what, what would be sort of if you transferred your logic to running these societies, how would they, would they look different? 
Um, is it possible to have like all these different countries without a sense of national identity, or is that, or is having a national identity separate from what we define today as nationalism? So to go to the first part of what you said, uh, I don't think it's the case that states or nations are forms of association that mm. have any particular connection with ethnicity. In part, I think this is because ethnicity itself is not something that's easy to shape or categorize. Even if you leave aside people who are of mixed descent, that mm. is to say, descended from parents who have different ethnicities, even the ethnicities of the, uh, of the parents, if you look back um, you know, long enough, you'll see that they are themselves descended from uh, groups that are capable of being differentiated, if you want to. But human beings are, in a sense, you know, continuous. There's, there's no sharp distinction between mm. one kind of uh, ethnicity and, and another. They, we, and we exist on a continuum where you draw the line to distinguish one kind of people from another kind of mm. people is to a certain extent arbitrary. What creates these uh, identities is to some extent circumstance. You could be isolated and perhaps even in conflict with another group which will solidify that sense of identity. Sometimes that identity is solidified by the emergence of, uh, of nation states. So that's what creates people who are French or mm. Italians or Germans or Greeks. Mm. But historically, these people weren't actually French as such before France became um, France. It was made up of many different peoples before Germany became mm. Germany. It was also full of different peoples mm. in Italy before unification. People spoke many different languages. In Indonesia, similarly, people spoke and still speak many different languages. But uh, now you might identify an Indonesian ethnicity, but it's not something that's real in a different mm. sense. It's become a reality because of, uh, of politics. Mm. And do you think the, uh, the solidification of that identity because of politics is a net good or net bad? I guess in many, some countries it might be a net bad, but perhaps you can argue that uh, for a country that has a strong rule of law, um, court system, all the great things that we want under one single political umbrella, perhaps is a good thing. So do you think uh, for those that are interested in you know, trying to extend that liberal order as far as possible, that it requires national identity, or can you do, do you think we can do that without uh, some sort of some binding um, I don't think it's required, but I think it's inevitable. Hmm. Uh, the question is how much significance should be attached to that national identity. My reading of Australia, for example, which is a society, a society I'm very familiar with, the sense of national identity is quite weak to the extent that it doesn't really play a big part in Australian political life. It's not invoked uh, very much. From time to time, it might be by political actors, but because of the, the nature of that society and its own history, there isn't a strong sense of, uh, of national identity uh, mm. in political debate uh, that you might find, say, in the United States. You won't find people accusing one another of not being mm. Australian or not being Australian in the right way. So I, I don't think it's something that's, uh, uh, that's vital or, or necessary. Mm. Australia overall is uh, a very peaceful, very stable uh, country. It's extremely prosperous. It's mm. very free. Um, but you haven't got this um, rhetoric of, uh, of nationality. Although I think you know, if you press people and ask them, they want to say, yes, you know, I'm a loyal Australian and so on. But but only mm -hmm. if you if you press them. Mm -hmm. But then there are other countries where it is much more of a, of a big deal. The other thing you might consider is the fact that, uh, let's say, in, in Europe, you have the European Union, which is in itself a kind of political entity. 
Now, it has struggled to establish uh, membership of the EU as constitutive of mm. a kind of identity, because when pushed, people will say, no, no, I'm French, or I'm German, or mm -hmm. I'm Spanish, or I'm Portuguese. But at the same time, the fact that they do all uh, coexist under the umbrella of this other political entity tells you something about the, uh, the significance of nationality. Hmm. I'm not saying that it isn't really important in some places, but it's not as important in others. Uh, and of course, it's also something that's invoked from time to time by political leaders who want to you know, persuade their populations or to gain support in some way. So, for example, if uh, the leadership of Poland or Hungary want to uh, persuade their populations or gain support in some way internally, they might do it by, say, criticizing the EU and emphasizing mm -hmm. that, no, we are Poland, or we are Hungary, we are a sovereign people. And then, of course, you know, you'll get that reaction from the, uh, the populace. But at the same time, they're also happy to give some of that up in order to gain the benefits of being under the umbrella of the European Union. Mm. So I think all of these things are things that can be traded off for one mm. good or another. How important it is, is going to vary. Uh, this is why I'm, I'm skeptical about the significance of nationality in itself. Mm. I don't think it's that important. Mm. So where do you think um, these, like a deep sense of political values often related to ordered liberty comes from? Like, where, what do you think actually keeps that in place for societies like Australia or here in the U.S. and the U.K.? Um, you can name some other countries, right? So what do you think is the anchoring force that makes it, makes it all tick? Um, I, I wish I knew. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, because the societies that have um, that kind of uh, freedom and uh, political stability really do vary a lot. I mean, you've obviously got uh, uh, the countries of the, let's say, the liberal democratic West that are like this. But then there's quite a bit of difference between, say, Australia and New Zealand on the one hand, and say, uh, you know, France or Spain or Italy, you know, uh, on the other. They, their politics are really quite different, um, much less um, conflictual within Australia and New Zealand, even, even though there are obviously in, in any society, mm -hmm. um, you know, important differences, but they're not as visceral, let's say, as they are in some other liberal democratic countries. Now, why is that the case? I'm sure history has a lot to do with it. The context in which they're in has a lot to do with it. Um, the success of their economies has a lot to, to do with it. So mm -hmm. policy can, can make a difference. In times of prosperity, people are generally a lot happier, mm. no mm -hmm. surprise. Mm -hmm. So uh, given that all of these things can be shaped by events, I think it's very difficult to um, say you know, definitively what is the, uh, the reason for this. Of course, there are, there's no shortage of uh, attempts to explain what it is that's behind the stability or the freedom of particular countries. Uh, so, if, for example, you have works like those by Asimoglu and Robinson mm -hmm. on uh, why nations fail. But um, the direction of causation is really often difficult to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to settle satisfactorily. Uh, is it that they're prosperous because they're free or are they free because they're more prosperous? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's always difficult to tell. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, I said I wanted to talk about your work on Hayek, and then we kind of this conversation was, was a little too fascinating. But um, to discuss that a little bit, did was did anything we just uh, you just said relate to uh, your work with Hayek, or was this kind of a separate area of research? Um, well, I started writing about Hayek when I decided to write my uh, doctoral thesis on mm -hmm. on Hayek's thought. So this is. Uh, uh, you know, 40 years ago now that I that I started, a bit more than that. So I'd started to read him a little bit earlier still. So uh, I've been living with him for a very long time. Mm -hmm. 
So I think my thinking has definitely been shaped by by reading Hayek's work and engaging it. I don't think I started to, to read him because I have the views that I have, but I'm sure that a lot of the uh, the thinking that I uh, that I you know that I have is due in in one way or another to uh, to Hayek's influence. But uh, but there are other things in my background as well. The the fact that I grew up in in Malaysia, which was a society that was uh, uh, divided officially into three major races or ethnicities, Indians, um, mm -hmm. Malays, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. And then there was a smattering of people from other uh, um, ethnicities. Mm -hmm. um, and Malaysia had very, very deliberate uh, affirmative action policies which mm -hmm. favored the Malay majority. So that mm -hmm. shaped my thinking a lot. My father also shaped my thinking because I think he was uh, a good liberal. He mm -hmm. was a journalist, a, a diplomat, a radio broadcaster, strong believer in the rule of law, mm -hmm. um, individual freedom, mm -hmm. very, very skeptical about the state. So I probably learned a lot of that, um, you know, before I even uh, set eyes on a page of, of Hayek's thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your thesis about Hayek is, and I guess this would come off as shocking to, I guess, libertarians who have not read your work, is that his defense of liberalism is incomplete, but do you do agree with what he has to say about like, human nature generally? So can you maybe give us a little primer on, first, what's, what is, what, how would you summarize his defense of liberalism, and then what is your critique? Okay, so um, at its most philosophical, I think Hayek's defense of uh, liberalism is grounded in a certain kind of uh, skepticism about uh, what we can know and how much we can control the mm -hmm. uh, external world. And I'm very sympathetic to this. Um, but the, the, the difficulty, I think, philosophically is to both hold that um, there's a limit to what we can know um, and what we can control to, to combine that with a thesis about then what we should do as a matter of, uh, of public policy. Mm. Uh, and basically what I tried to show in, um, in my analysis of Hayek's thought is that this tension r runs right through the work and I don't think it's, uh, it's resolvable in philosophical terms. At the same time, um, you know, what I find still very compelling in, in Hayek's uh, thought is this, uh, you know, this epistemic humility, if you like, this mm -hmm. uh, conviction that there's a limit to what we can know, there's a limit to, to what we can con control, uh, and the more we try to control, the more we will fail, at least as measured by mm -hmm. our success in reaching the goals that we that we have. Mm -hmm. So, um, with you know, uh, with that understanding, I'm less and less um, sympathetic to to programs for the betterment of mm -hmm. society. To um, to improve things or to reach certain goals or to mm -hmm. um, make some sort of progress according to a, an accepted standard. <coughs> I'm, I'm more you know, now, and I think increasingly of the view that we, we can address specific problems, um, but they, they're tractable to the extent that our goals are modest. If we overreach will have an effect because every policy has an effect, but we won't uh, necessarily reach the, the outcomes that we think we will. And we may even do a lot of damage. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, now that general orientation is still compatible with a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very, very different kinds of uh, policy decisions because it's not an argument for liberty more than it's just common not, sense. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so 
The other thing that I take from, from Hayek is his, his very strong commitment to, to individual freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's not that he's just interested in freedom for utilitarian views because he thinks that freedom is, is useful. He actually has a very strong um, commitment to freedom in itself. He mm -hmm. thinks that uh, restricting people, limiting what they can do, trying to control them is a bad thing in itself. And he thinks this in part because he thinks that trying to control people will not just restrict them, but will also transform them. Um, to the extent that you succeed in restricting them, you will not only stop them from doing certain things, you will also uh, lead many of them to accepting their um, their loss of freedom. Mm -hmm. They will come to simply internalize this and no longer care about this. Uh, and I think Hayek wants to say this is uh, a bad thing, not just because it has uh, unfortunate consequences, it makes it much more easy for uh, for tyrants or dictators, despots of all kinds, to control other people, which is a bad thing. But it's also bad in itself to the extent that it makes human beings different. Mm -hmm. It makes them people who don't really care about their own freedom. And I think it also means, so this is not a point so much that Hayek makes, it makes them more indifferent to the freedom of others. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I think this is really important. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of good things in terms of observations about just in the objective sense what happens to people under certain regimes. And then, in terms of your critique about uh, the knowledge problem is sort of like the basis of his liberty argument, how would you, in your, how would you personally resolve it? Like, what do you think he should do to make a good case for liberty? Uh, well, I think he does make a good case for uh, for liberty. As I said, I, I think it's only at this very deep uh, philosophical level mm -hmm. that uh, there's a tension in the, in, in the argumentation. Mm -hmm. But I think you can still actually say quite coherently that uh, uh, you know, we should limit our ambitions, especially mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, uh, the things we try to do at the uh, widest sort of level, at the level of uh, uh, national society, for example, and even more if we have uh, a large political society. But uh, we can, I think, for example, reasonably deduce from this that uh, uh, it would be better to have societies that are not highly centralized, that are not... Um, um, you know, governed remotely by uh, single authorities. Better mm -hmm. to have a society uh, or societies that uh, are, in a certain sense, internally divided to the extent that you know political authority exists in many different places, where there is genuine contestation, uh, and there isn't an attempt to resolve the the conflicts in order to figure out what is the right answer. We simply live with, uh, with the conflict, with the pluralism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in a way, that is something that lies at the heart of the, of the liberal idea. Mm -hmm. Liberalism simply accepts that uh, differences uh, and conflicts are ineradicable. Mm -hmm. So the, the trick is to find a way to, to live together despite these these differences. But there's also something in the liberal tradition which is, for example, very concerned about things like poverty, which inclines a lot of liberals to, um, to want to address these things as a matter of greater urgency. Mm -hmm. And you can understand the motivation. But, uh, but I think overreaching runs the risk that you will um, rather than live with conflicts, you will exacerbate conflicts because people will differ. Uh, and if you don't have, let's say, 
a world in which different people look for different solutions, but you have uh, a single polity trying to find a single solution, well, that makes the contest uh, really important because there's a lot more at stake. Uh, and that is going to make politics more bitter uh, and is also going to make failure uh, more uh, difficult to undo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've got lots of different societies, one fails, the others might be more likely to learn from that. If they're all adopting, generally speaking, the same set of uh, policies or institutions, uh, those who've pushed for those institutions have a stake now in keeping them mm. because uh, it would be an admission of failure to try to undo it. Mm. Also, when you build up institutions like this, you'll always have stakeholders uh, who are doing well by those institutions, mm. much harder to undo it. Mm. Um, so Hayek himself does say, I think, in The Road to Serfdom that you know, good societies tend to be smaller ones, mm. and he's very skeptical mm. about the idea of a, of a large-scale society, which is interesting uh, given that when he wrote the Constitution of Liberty, um, he dedicated it to, uh, I think I'm quoting correctly, the unknown civilization that is growing in America. Mm -hmm. So um, if I were here now, I'd like to ask him what he <laughs> thought about the United mm. States mm. as... Uh, yeah. To go back to the questions you started with, uh, in a world of uh, nationalism, what, he, what, what did you think about the, the rise of nationalism in, uh, in the United States? Mm -hmm. um, Hayek always uh, consistently took the view that nationalism was a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, he uh, at one point, uh, maybe in several points, says nationalism is nothing but the twin brother of socialism, mm. Mm. Uh, bearing in mind his own particular view of what socialism was. Mm -hmm. And do you think that perhaps he had his sort of standard academic take, which is, you know, this sort of marketplace with small societies that kind of learn from one another, and then perhaps the, the, like the emerging society he references constitutional liberty might be, because I do know he had some vision of a I guess society of free men or community of free men idea. And I believe that kind of, I remember someone presented, was talking about his foreign policy views. So perhaps like maybe he had his very practical objective take of a bunch of small societies that sort of kind of check each other and balance each other and learn from each other. And then perhaps he had like a dream about, you know, maybe perhaps one day we might have a international community of free societies, free men. Perhaps you think that's where he was going. Yeah, with that. Um, I, I don't know. Um... He definitely thought that uh, smaller units of governance were, were to be preferred. But at the same time, he was also concerned about another problem, which is you know, uh, international war, mm -hmm. not least because he lived, grew up in Europe, which saw two you know, uh, world wars in his own lifetime. Mm -hmm. So... He did write about the idea of an uh, interstate federation. <coughs> he thought that might be a useful way of trying to resolve the problem of conflict between mm -hmm. societies. So he was not averse to the idea of developing international institutions. Mm -hmm. If anything, I, I guess he would say you needed those mm -hmm. uh, because if you have different governments, then you need to find ways in which they can interact with one another on a consistent, principled, uh, you know, ordered uh, basis. Uh, but whether that would mean that you would then create an international uh, super state, uh, let alone a world government, I think that's another thing altogether. Mm -hmm. for, for, for me, his thinking leans in the direction of uh, a much looser form of, uh, of federation rather mm. than uh, trying to develop something like a, uh, a unitary political order. Mm. So I just want to ask one more question because I know uh, the reception is probably going about right now, so I don't want to keep either of us from the drinks. Um, when it comes today, you know, we're seeing the rise of nationalism around the world. Um, Multiple wars have broken out at this point. 
What do you think is uh, one thing that we should keep in mind, especially, um, especially based on what we've been talking about today when it comes to uh, Hayek's ideas about uh, smaller government, smaller societies, and the danger of nationalism? What, what are some things that we need to, I guess, reemphasize, refocus on, and then, like, what's, what's a creeping tendency that, that we, we should be uh, cautious of? Yeah. Um, so I guess there are two um, ways in which to approach this question, depending on you know, who you mean by the we. The we could be mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the political elites, the political actors mm -hmm. uh, who actually make certain sorts of uh, decisions that are critical, whether you're talking about uh, Vladimir Putin, or you're talking about the British Labour Party, or you're mm -hmm. talking about uh, the French government. That could be, you know, a set of uh, we's. And then the other uh, we might be, uh, I'm going to leave aside just the populace in general, because mm -hmm. they are not likely to, uh, to act as a collective. But if you think about, let's say, uh, intellectuals, people who are interested in uh, political affairs, who are opinion makers and so on. Uh, so if you take those two uh, we's, I, I think if you're talking about the, um, uh, the, the political actors, uh, what I think we would uh, hope for is a certain kind of, uh, of moderation, uh, an interest and willingness to look for ways of accommodating rather than looking for ways of uh, you know, just simply strengthening their own powers and pushing through an agenda that reflects a narrow constituency. Now, how likely this is to happen? Well, mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, you know, uh, not a lot. Mm -hmm. To some extent, but not always. So if you look to uh, Russia, for example, that's not going to happen. Even if you look to, say, Modi's uh, India, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. There are uh, very narrow agendas pursued by people whose uh, interest in <coughs> the end, in the end is in getting their own particular vision uh, exemplified. Mm -hmm. So if we could find a way of diminishing that tendency, I think that would be, uh, that would be a lot better. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the other we, the, the intellectual elite, let's just say more broadly, those who are um, engaged in politics but not uh, decision makers. I think um, here I think what I would uh, like to see is a certain kind of uh, moderating of uh, people's tempers. Hmm. Um, less of a tendency to demonize uh, the other side, less of a tendency to try to um, you know, push for um, a very particular kind of uh, uh, you know, outcome or vision for the society uh, as a whole. That tendency is hard to, res you know, to, uh, uh, to resist because I think we live in, you know, in a time where national sentiment is, uh, is very powerful and also within nations the institutions that have been created are institutions that basically say to people, okay, we are problem solvers who will solve problems for the entire society, whether it's in terms of you know, defense or health care or education or you know, the general kind of welfare of society. These are the things these institutions promise. I don't think they can deliver on those promises because mm. we just don't have the uh, the wit to do so. We, mm. Going back to Hayek's uh, mm. epistemic humility, we don't have that capacity. Which isn't to say that we should do nothing. Clearly, there are some things that you know that need to be addressed. Um, we do need to think about what sorts of institutions uh, of governance we need. But I think as things stand, uh, we live in a world of uh, too much all or nothing uh, mm. politics. Mm. Uh, and I don't think that's a good thing. So if I had to say anything, I'd say, this is what we need to pull back from. I just wish I knew how to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, 
bring that about. Of course, and I guess that's the point of coming to conferences like this so we can perhaps one day find the answer. Well, Chandran, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Of course. Thank you.